Hi, everybody. Welcome and Happy New Year. It's nice to see all of you and some of your faces I haven't seen in a little while, so it's good to see you back. Um, <clears throat> is anyone here new to the Neighborhood Health Series that's never attended in the past? Okay, great. Well, welcome. This is our eighth year of the Neighborhood Health Series. We cover a range of health and wellness topics using our expert faculty um, and some of our community partners to share information with our community. And so we're very happy to have you. Um, we are going to hold questions to the end, if that's okay, and just letting everyone know that we're recording. So when you have a question, which we'll do at the end, we're gonna just make sure that you get this microphone or else the recording will not pick up your voice. And we like to post all of the recordings to the website so that people that are were not able to come can access it. Okay, so um, I don't see our sponsor here, but our entire series is sponsored by the Clark County Credit Union. They've been a sponsor with us for a long time, and they are the credit union of mostly healthcare professionals. And so they um, have sponsored us and allow this wonderful event to happen. And so with that, we're going to get started. How many here have a New Year's resolution of being healthier? Okay. How many here have a New Year's resolution to actually lose weight? Okay. How many here have a New Year's resolution of finding a medicine to help them lose weight? Okay, no one, interesting, all right. Okay, well with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today who all come from our College of Pharmacy. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Chakraborty. He received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He did his postdoctoral training at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He joined the Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas as a 10 year track assistant professor of medicine. He studied the role of cytokines during inflammation in bladder and pancreatic cancer. He established the hypothesis that, hypothesis that cytokine G CSF and its receptor can serve as an early biological marker for the poor prognosis of cancer. He also joined University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center as an assistant professor of experimental therapeutics, pursued his interest in developing small molecule inhibitors of major cytokine signaling pathways in cancer and immune cell migration. Before jo joining Roseman, he also worked for a short time in biotech um, as a project manager. Currently, he teaches biochemistry and pharmacology of cancer, lipidomic, and diabetes here at Roseman's College of Pharmacy. He was elected as teacher of the year multiple times and is very beloved by his students. His other areas of interest include computer languages and databases. His research on protein synthesis, inflammation biology, cancer biology, cancer drug development, and scholarly teaching resulted in more than 30 publications in different scientific journals. He received institutional research set of funds from the Baylor College of Medicine, multiple NIH grants, a USDA research grant, and a Lori Strauss Leukemia Foundation grant. I'd like to also introduce Alana Whitaker, PharmD Professor of Pharmacy Practice. She received her Doctor of Pharmacy from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and completed her pharmacy practice residency at Centera Healthcare in Norfolk, Virginia, and her internal medicine specialty residency at Seton Family of Hospitals, University of Texas at Austin in Austin. She has a practice site at Valley Hospital in Las Vegas, where she rounds with an internal medicine team from the Toro University College of Osteopic Medicine and serves as a preceptor for both pharmacy students and residents. She likes to shop, read, and watch television in her free time. Last but not least, Dr. Catherine Leanna Oswald obtained her Bachelor of Science in Nutritional Sciences from the UNLV and her pharmacy doctorate from Roseman University in 2007. She's an associate professor of pharmacy practice and a board certified geriatric pharmacist. She serves as Roseman's College of Pharmacy Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Assessment, and she enjoys teaching in Roseman's unique six-point mastery learning model, covering topics such as clinical nutrition, immunizations, leadership, pharmacy law, pharmacy, and Medicare, and, and pharmacy um, capstone. She had a lot of things. This past fall, Dr. Oswald broke $1 million in grant funding for community work focused on advancing pharmacists' roles in caring for chronic medical conditions such as diabetes and heart disease and helping future pharmacists understand the complexity of Medicare. Many of you have probably been here before for her Medicare Call Lab presentation, um, which she takes all of our seniors through um, effortlessly. She oversees Rhett Roseman's Medicare Call Center, which has helped save Southern Nevadans over $2 million in estimated annual health care costs. A former Division I NCAA 
student athlete, Dr. Oswald spends outside time outside work coaching her daughter's youth volleyball teams, cheering all four of her children on at various athletic events, and traveling to see family and friends across the country and in Canada wherever possible. She is Canadian, actually. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chuck Rabordi. Do I change the uh, good evening, everyone? I don't know why I need lapel microphone because my I speak really loud still. Um, okay. Am I missing something? Oh, okay. So I would like to really thank uh, Clark County Credit Union for this unique opportunity. And I would also like to welcome you for uh, coming over with your busy schedule. Uh, there are three speakers who will be talking today. Uh, first, the worst one, the first one, me, and after me, like a Dr. Oswald, Dr. Oswald, I'm, I'm going to talk about like a food, bad foods and all these things, because looking at me, you can judge like I am a good judge of like a bad food. And uh, exercise part and everything, we are going to send an expert, Dr. Oswald, what is BMI, non-pharmacologic treatment. And Dr. Whitaker is going to talk about like a pharmacologic anti-obesity product, which is presently uh, in use in the market. And I'm going to talk about like a food that um, make um, ourselves fat. I'm not going to go in too detail, like it will be very basic. So there will be some nitty gritty details, like, a, you know, if you have that question, please hold that thing till the end of the talk. We are going to answer, what is food? Food is the fuel that we use to produce energy in our body. What is that energy? It's a chemical energy called ATP. ATP is also like, I think that's a tennis competition also, but it is a different ATP. Uh, this ATP, we need to produce all the time because everything, watching, seeing, talking, moving, even dreaming, all requires ATP. And food in biochemistry, food is whatever can we burn to make ATP. Now, there is a small steps I would like to show you. All food supposed to convert into acetyl-CoA compound. You don't need to know like what is that. It's acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA eventually enters into a metabolic pathway called TCA cycle. You don't need to know it's a big one. I am not going to go there. But eventually, that produces ATP. Now, all food does. What are the foods? We are going to, there are four types of foods you already heard. Carbohydrate, fat, protein, and ketone bodies. I'm not going to talk about like a proteins and ketone bodies today because like a, they are not linked at all with like a weight gain. I mean, protein-based weight gain is good weight gain, like a muscle and everything. We are not talking about that. We're talking about growing fat. Who are responsible for weight gain? Carbohydrate, number one. Number two, fat. Two ways you can gain fat. We think like uh, if we eat fat food, we are going to get fat. Yes, that is true. But we, are, we forget that like a, we, our body also makes fat, synthesize fat. And what is the precursor of that? Is carbohydrate. Carbohydrate actually makes synthesized fat in our body. As a matter of fact, carbohydrate is also responsible for major cholesterol production in our body. So that's why everybody talks about lower your carb, lower your carb because that is one of the major way we make fat in our body. Let's talk about carbohydrate a little bit more. Carbohydrate has like a, whatever carbohydrate you eat, starchy food, 
table sugar, milk sugar, eventually they will break down into glucose, fructose, and galactose, three carbohydrates. Out of these three, only glucose is essential, glucose. Glucose is so essential, without glucose we are dead. And as a matter of fact, like when we are starving, it is so essential, our body makes glucose. It converts amino acid or protein to glucose. It is so essential. But the funny thing is there are two other guys, fructose and galactose, we don't need them. We don't need them. Why we consume fructose then? Because it is sweet. It is like a sweet, sweet. That's why like our sweet teeth. That's why like we eat fructose. And I'm going to show you that is the really bad one. So glucose, fructose, galactose, they are all responsible fat synthesis in our body. And another way we can get fat, like eating lots of fatty food, because if I eat fatty food, we, and another thing I want to show you in the next slide, the carbohydrate, what it does. Now, glucose is good, but too much glucose, that is bad. Fructose, period, it's bad. Don't even think, bad. Galactose, we don't need this. Now, glucose, it glucose, fructose, galactose, all, converts to acetyl-CoA. And then acetyl-CoA goes to TCA cycle, produces ATP, when we need ATP. But when we do not need ATP, when we have enough ATP, what happened to this acetyl-CoA? goes to make fat and cholesterol. And that fatty acid eventually becomes triglyceride weight gain. So that's why. And another thing, very important. Glucose is also sweet. I mean, majority of the fruit we eat, like the sweetness that comes from glucose. And it is essential. I talk, talked about that. But another thing is, it is the most preferred fuel. If I eat glucose and fat, my body is not going to touch fat. It will eat only, utilize glucose. That is the important point, all right? Fructose, don't eat that. Next is fat. What is fat? Fats are two types, fatty acid. Fatty acids are like a long chain of like a carbon and hydrogen, this is one single fatty acid, or it can be triglyceride. Triglyceride is the storage form of fat. When like a three fatty acid bound to like a glycerol backbone, this is the structure, we call this triglyceride. Why we make that thing? To store fat in our fat cell, also known as adipose tissue. So that's why we prepare triglyceride for storage, for future use. And when we need to burn fat, we break fatty acid from triglyceride and burn. So fatty acid is good, nothing wrong. But normal amount of fatty acid, it will be acetyl-CoA, it will be TCA cycle, produce ATP. But if it is like a once I eat too much, then fatty acid will be converted to triglyceride and weight gain. And another thing important, if you have glucose in side by side with like a fatty acid, body won't touch fatty acid. So how we gain obesity, we already discussed. Excess fat in the diet that will be stored as a triglyceride. So fat cell is going to be fatter. Or if I eat carbohydrate too much, Excess carbohydrate, glucose, fructose, nasty one, galactose, they will be produce excess acetyl-CoA. And this excess acetyl-CoA is going to be uh, become fat. Now, finally, you have to understand why fructose is bad. Because our body can control glucose somehow. When like a, there are like a too much fatty acid production, then our body, body says, Hey, stop. Then glucose becomes stored in the liver as a glycogen. 
for fructose, no mechanism. The moment I'm eating excess fructose, it will leave acetyl CoA, it will be fatty acid, triglyceride. Fructose is the most lipogenic carbohydrate, and there is a study clearly shows obesity in US is directly linked with table sugar introduction in our diet. Good stuff, right? So food choice, I'm going to go from like a bad to worse. The bad choice, excess fat is bad, but still you are burning fat because glucose is low, carbohydrate is low. Or you can have like a high carb, that is bad too, because excess carbohydrate will be converted into fat. But if, you are, if I am smart enough, I can combine like a high fat and high carbohydrate. Now what is happening? My body will be burning only glucose. All the fat is going to store. And like a excess glucose is going to be converted into fat, again stored. And if I am really smart, I add on top of that a dessert. That's the best one, right? Now, we talked a lot of negative stuff, like a, how can we make it a little better? Well, now I have to talk a little bit about diabetes. Now, diabetes, what is diabetes? Diabetes is like a problem with insulin. Either it is not there or it is less, or it's not functioning. What insulin does? Insulin takes, promotes glucose absorption by muscle. So that's how like a glucose goes down. So in diabetes, since insulin is not working properly, my glucose level in the blood is high and muscle is crying for glucose. Well, I'm not getting anything. So seeing that like, I, you know, liver comes to rescue muscle, they produce on top of that, like all this glucose, they produce even more glucose and dump into the bloodstream. That is terrible. Now what is going to happen? Excess glucose, it will be converted to triglyceride by liver. And so diabetic people untreated, their triglyceride level is high. So let's talk about some remedy. Now, you know, when we eat food, the worst thing we do, if we eat all the high carb and, and high fat very quickly, then like all the glucose and fat, everything rushing into the blood really fast. And our body has a tendency to convert into fat more quickly. So if you can slow down the entry, it will be much better. How can you do that thing? Simple, add fiber. Add fiber, especially soluble fiber. That is going to slow down your glucose absorption. That is going to slow down even block partially fat absorption, even cholesterol absorption. So the great thing you can do to um, your food is like add fiber into and more like a soluble fiber and exercise, burn them. Burning fat and glucose, the one of the great way is like if we can activate a special enzyme called AMPK, AMP kinase. How can you do that thing? By brisk walking. But you know, I wanted to cover more about this thing, but Vanessa told me like, you know, I'm not an expert on exercise anyway. So I was going to bring in Dr. Oswald to talk about exercise and other stuff. Thank you. Don't you feel lucky for our students to get to have him as a teacher? Can you see now why he's teacher of the year repeatedly? Like we had to create a rule where you can only be teacher of the year every other year. Otherwise he'd win it every year. Uh, he's so dynamic. Uh, an expert on exercise. I'm not sure I'm an expert on exercise, but I sure have had to do a lot at UNLV when I was playing volleyball there. 
We are going to talk a little bit in my section here about BMI, how BMI is used in the clinical world to help to guide therapeutic recommendations and other recommendations. And we're going to talk about what Dr. Chakraborty said, some of those non-pharmacologic treatments that would be expected and are actually part of all of the studies associated with determining what anti-obesity anti drugs work. All of the groups that are in the clinical trials were on diet and exercise, the placebo and the um, uh, uh, control uh, or the, uh, um, what am I blanking on a word here? Help me out, Dr. Rollins. That's group, thank you. I do have some disclosure, disclaimers or disclosures to uh, put out there that I do receive funding from the State of Nevada Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Dignity Health Community Grants Program and Dignity Health sponsors one of the programs that I'm gonna talk about um, that's here in the Valley. And then the Health and Human Services uh, part of the, um, uh, oh, I am tired today. I needed some more glucose before I came up here, apparently, Dr. Chakraborty. Uh, some of the programs that we're gonna talk about for uh, free programs for diabetes, if anybody in here is uh, diabetic. And then the information on my slides, as well as Dr. Whitaker's and Dr. Chakraborty's, it is not intended to be medical advice to have you make medical decisions. Uh, rather, it's educational information. Uh, you should not start, stop, change any medications without consulting your medical provider. All right, question time. How many calories does it take to gain or lose a single pound Dr. Uh, Rollins can't answer that. He's our clinical doctor. 3,500. You are right, 3,500. And that's roughly, if you wanted to visualize it, that's what about a pound of fat looks like if you were to hold it in your hand. And so about 3,500 calories, gain or take, or give or take a little bit there. How many calories are in a can of soda, roughly? The one regular sized can of soda, they make the smaller ones now that are 100 calories, but one regular size is gonna be anywhere from 200 to 250 calories. When you think about that, if you cut two sodas a day, if you drink regular soda, that's almost 3,500 calories in a week and you make no other changes, that could be a difference. Now I said that we're gonna talk about body mass index or BMI. So what is BMI? It's a weight to height ratio. And the higher that that ratio is, with some other things that we'll talk about, the more at risk you can be for being overweight, obese, and then having uh, clinical complications, uh, being more at risk to develop things uh, like diabetes. And then if you do, having complications associated with. I have a little sheet in front of you where you can calculate your BMI, but don't worry, you don't have to use these numbers, whether you like the imperial system or the metric system. I'm Canadian, as they mentioned, I like the metric system. If you have a smartphone, you can go ahead and pull it out and scan the QR code. And it's gonna take you right to the CDC website, which has a little BMI calculator. You don't have to put in any personal information, you're just putting in your height and weight. It's not asking you for anything else and you can identify your BMI and write it down, which will be helpful for the rest of the presentation if you want to do so. I saw some of you were sharing a phone, so I gave a little, little extra time there. But if you scan that code and you've got it up, you should be able to put your height and weight in and see what your BMI is. All right, so what do we use BMI for? Well, along with visual inspection, because some people can have very high BMIs but still be in very good shape, along with this visual inspection and sometimes a waist circumference as well, 
BMI is used to help classify your risk for certain things. If your BMI calculated out to be less than 18.5, you would be classified as underweight. And what would be the risks there? Some possible nutri nutrient deficiencies, maybe some possible bone fractures and so on. Uh, we wouldn't know until we did more of a, of a medical exam. And we're not focused on underweight today. A healthy weight, you would fall within 18.5 to uh, less than 25, so 24.9. If you're in that range, you're considered healthy, but not everyone. And we'll talk about that. Overweight is considered 25 to just under 30 or 29.9. There's a little asterisk there that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but if you're overweight, then you start to be at risk again for developing certain uh, diseases or conditions that can cause health complications. And then being obese would put you at a BMI of 30 or more. You can then get into classify obese class one, obese class two, obese class three, but really for the recommendations that we're going to be talking about and where these anti obesity drugs fit in, just the classification of obese will be what we'll be talking about. Now, if you are of South Asian, Southeast Asian, and East Asian genetic hereditary, then your numbers are slightly different potentially. Um, your BMI of 23 could be putting you at risk for being overweight, and similarly, 27, 28 could be at risk for uh, obesity. BMI is not always correct though, as I mentioned. Highly muscular people like The Rock, he's got a BMI of 34. I looked it up on the internet today, so it has to be right. Uh, and so we do need to confirm like visually that you are carrying excess adipose tissue, what we saw in that hand on the previous slide. And then waist circumference can also be helpful. You might be in that healthy weight group, but if you have a waist circumference for a female of 35 inches or more, and for a male 40 inches or more, or more that might move you into a more risky category of overweight or obese. And then these were the, the countries associated with South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia, if you're of uh, that genetic hereditary descent. What are the health risks that we have associated with being overweight or obese? You've heard it, diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, heart disease, gallstones, stroke, cancer, liver disease, sleep apnea, which then can cause heart issues, all go up when you're carrying excess adipose tissue. Um, and if you're looking at your BMI number and you're starting to sweat a little bit, you're probably not alone. In the U.S., 39.6% of U.S. adults are considered obese and 316 overweight. So almost what more than half of our population would fall into those two risk categories. That's from uh, uh, 2022 research from the Food and Research and Action Center. Why do we use these numbers? Well, if once we've kind of established where you might fit in the realm of these boxes, and we hate putting people into boxes, but it's helpful to know what guidelines they might be following, we have two sets of guidelines for obesity. Uh, the 2014 American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the Obesity uh, Society, they call them the ACC, AHA, AHA, and TOS guidelines, as well as the 2016 American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, ACE, and American College of Endocrinology, ACE, sorry. Um, these two guidelines work together um, to come up with a lot of recommendations that you would receive if you go into your medical provider and you fall into one of these boxes. What's interesting about them? When did Ozembic become cool? Like this year. <laughs> so my, uh, a little bit after uh, the uh, guidelines came out, there is a more recent paper that kind of combine what we have knowing right now um, in there. It's not a guideline, but it combines some more current information. And then there is one guideline for pediatrics, as you'll see on Dr. Whitaker's slide, where some of these medications are even approved for use of 12 and above. Um, and that it comes from the American College of Pediatrics. So what happens with your numbers? You fall into a chart. And within this chart, if you are overweight, again, in the ranges that we already mentioned before, dietary habits, physical activity, and behavior modification. Do you see anti-obesity drugs on there? No, you're not recommended to be using them. Do people use them? Yes, it's possible, um, but it's not recommended. That's why your insurance doesn't cover them. If you're falling into this bucket, they're gonna be very expensive because clinic, 
clinical guidelines say not useful. You should be working on healthy habits, healthy lifetime habits that might help you to manage your weight. Um, now, if you're overweight and you have some comorbidities, that's the blue chart, uh, the blue kind of column on that colored chart with the tiny font. Uh, I didn't create it. I took it from the guidelines for you. If you have one or more comorbidities and you are 27 or 25, if you're of that Asian uh, population groups, then you should be doing diet, physical, behavior, and might be a, ca a candidate now for anti-obesity um, medications. They are not bad. Anti-obesity medications are not bad. They have a place in the clinical guidelines for a reason because they can work. If you can help to lose weight, you help to decrease your risks with, associated with a lot of disease states. So they're not bad, but they're not for everyone. If you fall into the obese category with comorbidities, you might be in this section here, which was just saw above, and or bariatric surgery. We're not going to talk about that a lot, but that is even part of the guidelines where insurance companies now do even pay for certain high risk 40. Uh, a lot of times if you have a BMI of 40 or above, it's hard to even start exercising. Physically, you can't do it. Bariatric surgery might be able to help you to uh, reduce some weight or loved ones or other people that you know, reduce some weight so they can become physically active and get into healthy habits. So there are all kinds of recommendations, again, backed by science and part of the clinical guidelines. Yes? Uh, you don't have copies of this chart. I don't know, can, can that be sent out after the presentation? I can have that sent out. Um, this is just my summary of the guidelines. It's not, um, it comes from the 2016, but we can email that out. Yeah, great question. All right, so now on your sheet, you should have your BMI written down on that kind of first sheet that you did, if you did it. Now you might also take a look and just kind of quickly scan down. And if you're comfortable, if you want to, you could circle anything that applies right here. And if you circle anything on that list and you're 27 or above for your BMI, you become a candidate possibly for anti-obesity drugs. Give you just a moment to kind of look at the really tiny font that I gave to all of you. All right, and what's the good stuff with weight loss? So also within these guidelines and published in multiple medical uh, journals are the benefits of weight loss. You don't, if you are carrying excess adipose tissue, if you are overweight or obese, a little bit of weight loss can make a big difference. You don't have to become a supermodel in the process to get health benefits. And that's important to know too. In fact, the paper that I referenced as the 2022 paper that's combining the two guidelines says five to 10% weight loss. That's the goal now for anyone who is overweight or obese, five to 10% weight loss. And some of the benefits can be you reduce your risk of hypertension or high, uh, high blood pressure. This lipidemia, which Dr. Chakraborty talked a little bit about from that cholesterol uh, line going and, and building up, you increase your good HDL, this number associated with living longer, and you decrease your bad HDL, this number associated with dying sooner, right? And so that's a benefit of losing weight. Type two diabetes, you can decrease your risk of developing type two diabetes by 30 to 60% with a maintained weight loss of 2.5 to 5.5 kilograms, which is about five and a half to 12 pounds roughly. So there are benefits there to getting healthy. And that is why these anti-obesity drugs can be good. They can be really good for our population overall that's 60% plus overweight and obese right now. So to achieve weight, to a, how does a person lose weight? You're gonna uh, restrict your calories, you're gonna increase physical activity, or you're going to do a little bit of both. The example that I gave at the start was the soda, right? If I cut 3,500 calories worth of soda from my diet for a period of time, I'm gonna start losing some weight there and I don't even have to do extra exercise. If I wanna cut half of the calories from soda and half of the calories I'll then cut because I'm exercising, so I'm burning more, that's a way to do it. If I don't want to change any of my diet, but I increase my exercise and I haven't exercised a lot, I'll go into a little bit of a, of a deficiency, which is going to cause me to lose a little weight, but eventually it'll plateau. If you 
even if you've gone down. So if you're consuming 5,000 calories a day and you go down to 4,000 calories a day, you'll lose a little bit of weight, but then you're gonna plateau if you're still above the number of calories per day that you need to be consuming overall. Um, a very simple way of looking at it from the guidelines is that you can, if you're a woman, try to focus on consuming 1,500 or 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. That's about a 500 to 700 calorie deficit because it's just loosely recommended without doing your individual needs that about 2,000 calories a day is what a woman would need. For a man, that then converts to 1,500 to 1,800 calories a day that you would want to be within. And then that's kind of what I said. If you were figuring out how many calories you're currently consuming, you kind of average out your food for a couple of days, and then you can decrease that by about 500 to 700 calories a day. You'd be losing about a pound a week, which is what we associate with healthy weight loss, doing it just through diet and exercise. All right, low calorie intake achieved by restriction and elimination of particular food groups is also an option. What do I mean there? Name me a fad diet. Keto. Keto diet, right? What's another one? Atkins. Atkins lets me eat as much bacon as I want to. No, it doesn't. If you really follow Atkins, you're consuming less than 2,000 calories a day in the true Atkins diet. You're calorie restricting. Now, you're also following some of what Dr. Chakraborty said in reducing your carbohydrates, which is going to turn on certain metabolic pathways within your body as well. But usually, these fad diets really restrict calories, which is where their success is. For some people, that's easier to follow. If I have to be restrictive in what I'm doing, I can follow it better than having too many choices and then I'm successful. So from my viewpoint, I'd say, hey, do that fad diet if it's going to work for you and you're getting the nutrients that you need to be healthy. Here are some uh, th diets that we go over with our pharmacy students as well in the classroom. The first, the food pyramid. Who learned about the food pyramid in school? Man, I had to memorize that thing. I had tests on that thing. Uh, remember, I, I was a nutrition major at UNLV. This was like, you, you knew this inside and out. I couldn't look at pizza the same because it's a triangle. And then in 2005, I, they wanted to get really complicated. They took the pyramid and then they made it all vertical and then down in different ways. And then they realized nobody could follow this thing. It's not used anymore. In 2015, it was repla replaced with the MyPlate. Is anyone familiar with MyPlate? Have you seen that? Kind of thinking about, first off, a nine inch plate, so portion control, and then dividing that so that you're getting 25% protein, 25% grains, and 50% starchy and fruits, fruits and vegetables. Uh, they also have modified this as well for vegan diets, so it does, that protein source does not have to be animal um, on there. And then you can add servings of dairy uh, as your individual diet allows if you can consume dairy. Harvard came out with a slight modification to the myplate.gov, which is, this is the federal government's. Harvard says, you don't need dairy at all. They're listening to Dr. Chakraborty who says, you don't need galactose in the diet. It's optional, but you don't have to have it. Um, they're also not sponsored by the dairy farmers. Uh, I drink a gallon of milk a day, so I don't mind milk, but um, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. They also added healthy fats as something important to have as part of your diet. And then their breakdown is pretty similar to the way the rest of the plate looks, but they say more veggies, less fruit. The DASH diet, anybody heard of the DASH diet before? Okay, a little bit of mix on the DASH diet. It's the dietary approach to stop hypertension and it got its cool funky little name because it would be just a dash of salt. Reduce your sodium, um, increase, uh, so it's a low sodium diet, high in fruits, high in veggies, high in healthy fats. Um, limit the saturated fats. Uh, try to cut down on your red meats and uh, limiting sugar. This is like the most studied diet. It came out in the 70s. Um, and it's still today on Medscape that just released la a couple of weeks ago, the top diets for 2024. It's up there in the top three in terms of like researched good diets. Mediterranean diet. Oh, sorry, this came out in the 90s. This came out in 75. Uh, Mediterranean diet. What do we like about the Mediterranean diet? What made it popular?
You could have red wine on it. Who doesn't love a diet that includes an alcoholic beverage? So the thing here that they studied was in Europe, they eat a lot of fat. They eat carbohydrates and they're still skinny. What's going on here? Um, and they saw that they had portion control. Uh, the Mediterranean diet also has a social component to it. So you notice they get two hour lunches in some of these countries that follow the Mediterranean diet. They sit down, they have fun, they relax with their friends at the table, lunch and dinner. And when you do that, you reduce your blood pressure. You're talking, you might be eating a little bit less during that time. And a lot of times you're walking to and from work, getting or to and from going home and then back to your office or wherever you might be working, getting that exercise in that Dr. Chakraborty talked about. Um, and they enjoy in moderation, some wine in the diet as well, or an alcoholic beverage. So that made the Mediterranean diet popular, also well studied and good. In fact, those two diets are so good together that in 2015, Rush University Medical Center and Harvard Chan School of Public Health came out with a combined diet because something else that they found in these countries and people that were following this, these two diets was less Alzheimer's and less dementia. So now they all have the, the third diet that I kind of talked to you about is the MIND diet, the Mediterranean DASH diet intervention for no, neurodegenerative delay diet. I hadn't really heard about the MIND diet too much uh, prior to the, about two years ago. And instead of just saying food groups, it kind of gives you target numbers. So this is one, if you want like a roadmap to follow, you're following for the week. Am I getting this many servings of whole grains? Am I getting this many servings a day of my vegetables? Overall for the whole week, I can have some pastries, but am I limiting the amount that I'm having and the portion size? So if you're having a pastry this big, that's not one pastry, that might be five pastries in one sitting. So keeping in mind what the serving size is, but that could be something good to follow as well. Okay, we talk about diet, that is not it. You notice that there was a one, two, three if you were overweight. Dietary habits, exercise, and behavior modification. Part of every clinical trial done on the anti-obesity drugs that Dr. Whitaker is going to talk about. The baseline expectation should be that you receive some form of counseling if you are overweight, 25 and above, on any doctor's visit that you go to or any medical provider visit that you go to. That just doesn't happen because there isn't time for it a lot. This question right here, how prepared are you to make changes in your diet to be more physically active and to use behavior change strategies as recording, such as recording your weight in a regular log or recording what you eat in a regular log? If you cannot answer yes to that question, you should not be on anti-obesity drugs because when you get off of them, you're gonna put all of that weight back on. This exact question comes out of the guidelines and I also put it on your sheet for you as a reminder to kind of think about if you can circle yes to that and you're a candidate for those drugs that Dr. Whitaker is gonna talk about, okay, maybe you're ready to try them. Um, if you're not there, these drugs are not gonna be magic for you. They'll be magic for a moment and when you're off of them, you're gonna be right back to where you started, maybe even worse. Other risk factors that play a role here. If you want to scan that one, this is a quick one minute assessment. If you are not a diabetic and you wanna know if you're at risk for diabetes, that is something that you can look at. And then another program that we have is if you are diabetic is diabetes self-management education. Uh, that program is a CDC initiative. It's been out for over five years now in every state. Uh, we have some programs here. I mentioned the Dignity Health the Southern Nevada Health District, this one is free. That one is not. Uh, that one is not free either, but they are on certain insurance covered. These are free programs. When I talk about behavior modification, they have nutritionists involved, dietitians involved. They have uh, like weekly training courses that you can take online or in person. They'll give you food journals, they'll help you out. So if you answered yes to the question on the last slide, but you don't know where to start, and you are at risk for diabetes, or you're a diabetic, we've got programs available to you here in Southern Nevada. <clears throat> Physical activity re recommendations from Healthy People 2030 include 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity a week. 
That equates to about 30 minutes a day. But you know what's nice about that? It's additive. You don't want to do a full 30 minutes or that sounds overwhelming. How about starting at five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and starting with 15 minutes a day in five minute increments and growing it from there. It's additive. So it does not all have to be at one time. Little bursts, little things that you do, parking further when you go shopping, using the stairs instead of the elevator, it really does start to add up. Um, and that can get you to the 150 minutes a week. Behavior modifications should be overseen by trained specialists. This can include registered dietitians, psychologists. Sometimes we have uh, really bad relationships with food that stem from really internal things that put us in those relationships with food. And until we can kind of fix some of the underlying issues, we might continue to um, use food not to just fuel our body, but to fuel our emotions. Exercise specialists, health counselors, and professionals in training, AKA students. UNLV, they've got a school of nutrition. They're always looking for somebody who wants to have, who wants to work with the students there. And that student really wants to know everything that you're eating and help you and develop you a plan. And it's free. Um, same thing would go uh, with uh, some counseling and some therapy as well. There are, there are options in town with our students who are in training that are overseen by, by uh, people that have the appropriate degrees and credentials to make sure they're giving you the right advice. Anybody know the difference between a registered dietitian and a nutritionist? The registered dietitian has to meet certain certifications. A nutritionist is we're signing her up to present next year as well because she answers all of the questions correctly and you were right um uh the way that i think about it is all registered dietitians are nutritionists they've got the background and the training but not all nutritionists have got a bachelor's degree and now a master's degree is required as well to be a registered dietitian that's newer they have to do a residency training in a, a year to get that certification. They have to take a board test to be a registered dietitian. So when you're looking online or you're looking in, the, in town or you go to GNC and they have nutritionist degrees, probably half of us could go online and in you know maybe an hour or so, get a nutritionist degree piece of paper. But if they're a registered dietitian, that's a credential that you can believe in. And again, for your insurance, when they cover nutrition counseling, it's usually with a registered dietitian. All right, so just a reminder, that's the slide that you wanted. I put it back up there because we're gonna head into my good colleague, Dr. Whitaker. Okay. All right, thank you guys um, for that good setup. Um, I am now going to talk about anti-obesity medications, and then I'm also going to talk about some of the over-the-counter and herbal products that people use for weight loss. But most of the time, I'm going to spend talking about the actual products, the actual medications we use. So we have a number of agents that we can use for weight loss, and they can work in different parts of our bodies. Some of them work centrally, like in our brain. Some of them we give for shorter periods of time. Some of them we can give for longer periods of time. We also have some that work in the periphery. That just means anything outside our brain. And a number of them actually have a mix of both mechanisms. But I'm going to start out with the injectable agents because these are the products where we get the most, I don't want to say bang for our buck because they're expensive but you see the greatest weight loss with these agents. These injectable agents have honestly revolutionized weight loss meds. When we talk about some of the other oral meds later, you maybe could get some people to 5% of their weight for them to lose it, but you can get people 10, 15, 20% of weight loss with these injectable agents, especially by the time you get to terzepatide. And from the slide that Dr. Oswald talks about and just the ability of losing weight to help us control um, comorbidities such as hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes, I teach diabetes, right? The impact of these drugs on diabetes is huge. 
So it's not only benefiting patients to lose weight, it's also benefiting them from a cardiovascular standpoint. So the first one that came to market was loraglutide. It's a GLP-1 agonist. So loraglutide and all three of them on this slide, we use them for diabetes and we also use them for weight loss. So, but we give them to people who don't have diabetes and what we can do is stop them from converting to diabetes or at least slow down that progression. But loraglutide, that came out first. Both loraglutide and semaglutide, these ones um, came out before. Loraglutide is a once a day, so you titrate that every week, but it's approved in people 12 and above. Also semaglutide. These two agents, what I want to point out though, the dose in weight loss is actually higher than the dose we give to patients with diabetes. So we go way higher. Like if I gave somebody loraglutide for diabetes, I take them to 1.8. But in weight loss and I give them Saxenda, I go to three. The same thing, the, the dose, the highest dose for, everybody knows Ozempic, right? Semaglutide Ozempic, that's the diabetes formulation. But if we give them with Colby, we go to a much higher um, dose. You get more weight loss with semaglutide. When, when, I remember when loraglutide hit the market and everybody was like, wow, because it was so much more than what we were seeing with our other weight loss drugs. But then semaglutide came out and it was like, knocked it, knocked it out to the park. Then we have terzepatide. We have people who are able to see more than 20% weight loss of this drug. And there are other drugs coming down the pipeline where you might actually see terzepatide type weight loss and even more. So that's super exciting. Terzepatide works not only on a hormone called GLP-1, but it also works on another hormone called GIP. And those two um, targets together is why we're seeing more weight loss. And some of the newer drugs that are coming out, they're hitting more than one hormone. So it's very exciting. Um, Terzepatide, because it's newer, hasn't gone in and done the testing on patients younger. So when our loraglutide and semaglutide first came out, they hadn't tested in them though in people less than 12, people less than 18, but they go back and they have to do studies and they're testing them for people younger and younger. Now, where this drug works partially is in our gastrointestinal tract. So we see a lot of what we would say gastrointestinal side effects. So people do complain of a lot of nausea and vomiting, a lot of constipation and diarrhea. You will see something called a black box warning for thyroid C-cell tumors. We have never seen that in a human. We, before we test drugs in humans, we test them in animals. They saw it in animals, but we have not seen it in humans. But we are talking about, imagine, think about how much you weigh now. If you could lose tw just 20 pounds, you'd be super excited, right? That's right. <laughs> right. So these drugs do make it possible. All of these drugs, as Dr. Oswald said, were studied. Not, so you, not just the drugs. All of these patients also had to do diet modifications, had to increase physical activity, because even when they gave these patients a drug and they gave placebo, the placebo group came down, but that was because they had intensive lifestyle modifications. But the difference in weight loss was stark. So Ozempic is what everybody probably knows, right? That's the one that everybody talks about. It came out for diabetes, but a lot of people use it for weight loss. With Colby is actually the weight loss drug. And again, you give it at a higher dose than what you use and what we give for diabetes. So I kind of went in and looked at some of the most, the newest headlines related to semaglutide. So we know when we give GLP-1s to patients who have diabetes, we draw their cardiovascular risk. We see less heart attacks. We see less strokes. We see less heart failure. They're fantastic drugs when we give it to diabetics. But the drug companies wanted to see, if I gave it to a non-diabetic, 
am I going to get the same benefit? And what they're seeing is you are seeing the same benefit. So your patients are losing weight. It's not that they're not only are they losing weight, but we are reducing their risk of cardiovascular events. So I'm sure if you're online, you get pop-ups all the time, you drive around the city, you see ads for weight loss clinics. So when you go to weight loss clinics, sometimes what people are given is not actually like the pens, the Ozempic pens or the Wacovi pens, they might actually get the drug in a vial. So what we are seeing, because people are taking home these vials, that sometimes people are injecting too much. And because of that, they've seen an increase in more than 1500% in people because of accidental overdose. Yeah, like you pull, you're supposed to pull up one cc and maybe you pull up three cc's. Um, but in addition, everybody knows Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers has been one of the most um, used weight loss programs in this country for years. But not, they have themselves have started to integrate anti-obesity meds into their um, into their programs. So in addition to the diet modifications, in addition to the increased physical activity, they have seen the benefit of integrating some of these anti-obesity meds. There was a study that looked at Ozempic and Wicovi to see if maybe patients had higher suicide risk, and they found actually that patients had um, lower suicide risk compared to other drugs that people use for weight loss. There was a warning that came out from the FDA last month, which because we are because a lot of people are getting medications through uh, maybe they're buying it on the internet, maybe the clinic that you're getting it from is not getting it from um, a standard dealer. They are seeing a lot of counterfeit product within the system. So when you got if anybody is you um, is using the product or you have family or friends are using the product. I teach, I've had several students who told me that they use these products and their family members use these products. I expect it. Um, you just wanna make sure that where they're getting the product from is a reputable source. So Ozempic, every, that's what everybody talks about because that came out first. But terzepatide, Monjaro, which is the diabetes formulation, Zepbound is the weight loss formulation. The dose is actually the same for terzepatide. Um, that came out later, but this, you, you will get more weight loss than the Ozempic. So we talked about the injectables. We love it because you see the most weight loss. But from a cost perspective, because when you're talking about if you have to go and you went to a physician and they wrote you a script for whether it's Ozempic or Wicovi or Monjaro or Zetbound, it's going to be over $1,000 a month, right? They're expensive. So your oral agents, you might not see the same amount of weight loss, but they're going to be a lot nicer on your wallet. We have a lot of, we have several products on the market. How these products have worked when we think about fentermine is they speed up your heart rate. They make it kind of makes your body think that you are exercising, right? The issue with that is though, that's not a good thing all the time. I'm putting you at higher risk for having heart failure and having other issues with your heart. So that's why your patients are not supposed to be on drugs like fentermine for years and years and years. The other drug that I will briefly talk about is Orlistat because Ally, you can get over the counter. And a lot of people do use this product. Your Orlistat has a prescription and an over the counter formulation, but it is a lipase inhibitor. Your patient, as if you use it, you need to have a certain amount of fat with that meal, but not too much fat. If you have too much fat, you're not going to be going, you can't go fast or from the bathroom. Okay, people will have fecal urgency. Their stool is going to come out being very oily. So you get a lot of malabsorption issues. So it, you have to be careful with the amount of fat you're taking when you're using it. So overall, when we talk about anti-obesity medications, 
when we talk about our injectable agents or newer agents, the ones that give us the most weight loss, they can be very expensive. You're talking about over $1,000 a month. And some insurances do not cover the cost of anti-obesity medications. It might be, and even if they do, it could be very complex with jumping through a lot of hoops, getting prior authorizations, looking back at what the comorbidities you have. Um, there are cost saving programs for some of these newer products. So if you did want to see if you were a candidate, you could look at your insurance and maybe see what they can do. So we talked about prescription products. Let's talk very briefly about over-the-counter and herbal products. So a lot of these have come in and out of um, fads in and out, but people talk about raspberry ketones. People talk about the HCG diet, hydroxycut, um, keto DHEA. When I put in and I was looking for herbal products that have been used in weight loss, this list is not even comprehensive. There are so many things which say in some capacity, we'll say, ah, they can help with weight loss. So anything from cayenne pepper to cinnamon, chromium, black pepper, that type of thing. What I want to say about herbal and OTC products, I'm never gonna tell people you shouldn't use them, right? Because a lot of people use them but I just wanna point out, they're not regulated. We don't really have clinical trials. And a lot of them, when we do do clinical trials, we don't see the benefit that people see that does occur. So a lot of them, we don't know how well they work, but we also don't know what safety issues they have. And as a pharmacist, when you do take herbal and OTC medications, irrespective of weight loss, please let us know because a lot of them interact with medications that you guys take. They can also interact, not just with medications, but certain conditions you have. And a lot of times, because I have this conversation with my mother all the time, she's a pharmacist too, but it's just that we always think because it's over the counter that it's safe. So we have this thing where we think about over the counter and herbal products are safe, but that's not always true. So some take home points, I wanna point out weight loss is hard, right? And I have definitely, I'm not that old, but I have realized there's a difference between my twenties and my forties, right? So I know it's going to, it's not going to be easier if I am blessed to live to fifties and sixties, but losing weight should take into consideration diet, exercise and medications are going to be an option for a lot of people. We give medications, for people who have high blood pressure. We give people medications because your glucose is high, your cholesterol is high. If I give you a weight loss drug, maybe you don't need some of those medications. If you can lose enough weight, you have the ability to maybe decrease or come off medications that we use with stuff like hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes. Um, there's not a one size fit all. So everybody in here, if we went to you individually, we might tell you different things that will probably make, it, make you successful. So we have different programs, different medications. Um, as, I, as I said before, the most popular anti-obesity meds now are somatoglutide and terzepatide. This is because we can get like 10% and above weight loss. I still want to caution about OTC also and herbal products. All right, here ends our presentation. I will now open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to know what is the difference between keto and Atkin diets? And uh, when you OD on the anti-obesity med, um, what are the side effects? Yes. Thank you. So the question is, if you overdose on anti-obesity, so you really mean the injectables, 
I'm going to tell you, the GI effects are going to make it that you know, you're you not going to overdose on these medications easily, right? A lot of people, when they take too much, is unintentional. When we give these medications, we titrate them up slowly because the nausea, the vomiting that people get, like you, your body needs to adjust to it and then go to the higher dose and go to the higher dose. If you uh, just took a really big dose to be like, oh, I really want to lose a lot of weight, so I'm going to skip the titration, you're probably going to be so sick, you're not going to want to be on that drug. Yeah. Oh, no, you're not going to die. No, the GI, no, 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 you're not going to die. The G, yeah, the GI effects are going to be real. Like I have one of my best friends, she tried terzepatite first. And she got to the smallest dose. She was like, I'm never taking this drug again. Right? She, her GI effects were just, like for her, they just affected her. And even she's trying Ozempic now. And she's moved to the higher dose. I was like, I think, because she goes to a weight loss clinic, I think you got titrated up so too quickly. Right? So my recommendation to her now is, you need see if she will bring you back down to the smaller dose for a little bit more. So although we titrate people up every four weeks, I'm like, maybe you're going to be that person that just needs to titrate up every eight weeks. So no, if you, you will not, it will be very difficult. I will never say it because we always say in medicine, there are no absolutes. You can't really like overdose on a GLP-1, but those side effects will make it intolerable for most people to take really high doses at one time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the paralysis of GI tract. Oh, so paralysis of GI tract. So, yes, they have been seeing that, right? And is that a worry that you can see? Yes, especially because of weight loss. We are using higher drugs than we use in um, diabetes. The vast majority of people, when you remove the drug so they stop taking it, the, it, the, the paralysis goes away. Oh, so yeah. So actually, it's not that dissimilar. So the, um, so if you take opioids, what it does do is because we have nerves in our GI tract. So like when we eat food, this is what happens. So it, we eat it, and then it comes down our GI tract like this. If I take opioids, instead of it doing like this it's not going to be doing it as quickly. So you're more likely to get constipation, right? Um, you do see that with the, um, with the GLP-1s. And that's what makes you feel full, right? One, that's one of the benefits of it. The benefits of GLP-1s, you will not eat that much because you are going to feel full for longer. It will stop you like if you're somebody who likes to go to McDonald's and supersize your meal, you will physically feel too sick to eat that same amount. It will stop you from eating as much. But the vast majority of time that they have been seeing increased reports, yes, of paralysis. But it after, but remember, we're given a drug that is like once a week. So if you stop taking it, it's not going to go out of your system right away. So once it gets out of your system, you'll start to see better innervation to your GI tract again. Does anyone know how they came up with these drugs? Anybody know the history of them? How did these drugs even come to exist? How did, it, well, it wasn't Ozempic first, but liraglutide, which actually before that, it was, it was Bieta. Bieta. They found the Gila monster. Anybody heard of the Gila monster? We have them in the desert here. It eats once a year and they studied how does this animal regulate blood sugar for an entire year eating only one time. And they realized that it's incretin hormone is high, the GLP one. Uh, and it, that helps it to feel full, slows the GI tract, keeps the food in there longer. And they created Bieta, uh, exenatide, the first, uh, diabetic drug. And they didn't really see a lot of weight loss with it. And then they created uh, the liraglutide, which was the saxe, the, the um, Victoza is the diabetic uh, component to it. They started to see some weight loss, 
But if we increase the weight on it, we see more weight loss. We come up with Saxenda. And then each version is a little bit uh, more potent version that comes forward where we're now at the terzepatide um, or that um, uh, Z-bound. To a degree, yes. Um, they ha have large fat stores though. So their bodies are continuing to burn those large fat stores compared to this animal that only eats once a, once a year, but maintains low fat stores in the process. Uh, you did ask the question about ke um, keto versus uh, Atkins as well. High level Atkins, you're going into this protein line. Keto, they're working to have you breaking down your ketone, um, which can be a little bit more dangerous than the Atkins diet. But ultimately, if you're really following Atkins strict and you're restricting all carbohydrate, you can end up in a keto stasis. So uh, that's just a high level way of thinking about them. It is like actually ignoring. So you you do not supply enough glucose to the your body. So you're forcing your body to the part of that. And, and the danger there can become that if you have no glucose at all, you're not feeding your brain with anything. That's where you can go into seizure. You can have uh, major uh, side effects with your kidneys and some other issues going on. So uh, but the, you need the glucose. Ketone bodies can't lead to ketoacidosis. Yeah. Yes. That's what I'm describing there. Yes. They're, they're, <laughs> they can't be dangerous diets. Yes. <laughs> Um, just some comments, not really questions. Um, one of the issues with the GLP-1 agonists is that they cause gastroparesis. And the anesthesiologists are very concerned with that side effect because of aspiration. So um, they are, they're still discussing how long a patient should be off a GLP-1, whether it's a week or a month. Um, there's no consensus at this point, but it's a major concern, especially if a patient is on the GLP-1s and requires urgent surgery for gallstones or some other intercurrent problem. So I think that's a cautionary concern there. Um, there's uh, another side effect that's been reported that is not life-threatening, but patients need to be made aware of it, and that is alopecia. And it may or may not be reversible when they stop the drug. So it needs to be mentioned to, to the patient as a possibility. Well, and I think part of it that they're looking at as well with that is that you are decreasing your calories so substantially because you're not eating is those nutrient deficiency risks Maybe. Um, associated as well, possibly. Yeah. Now, um, I, I would like to address the over-the-counter. Um, I think a lot of the effects that people claim they're getting from these assorted and sundry supplements is related to the placebo effect. Um, and I agree that we don't have studies that say yay or nay. So um, they are unknowns, they're not regulated, um, at least not as drugs. Um, and, and there's an awful lot of disinformation and misinformation that's floating around on the internet. Um, especially on TikTok and X, which formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> um, and and I, th I think that um, it, it behooves us 
to try to correct this dismiss information as much as possible um, because it's terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, the, the other thing that I wanted to comment on was um, needing to incorporate exercise into um, the obesity equation. Um, if, if you're losing weight just with diet, um, at least 50% of your weight loss is muscle weight, um, which is the reason that if you go on a diet and then you go off the diet, you gain the weight back even faster because you don't have muscle, which is metabolically active, to be burning the calories. So a lot of the yo-yo dieting is, is caused by that loss of muscle. And this is why I said you're going to be a presenter with us next year, right? She's, she's great. Do you have a question there, sir? Oh. Wait. <laughs> Obviously, they uh, tested based on age, less than 18, whatever. And most of the tables say 60 and over. But is there data on what if it's 80 and over or 90 and over? Your metabolism has changed. Everything's changing. Um, sorry, I was just saying the average weight in most of these studies, people are in their 40s. Um, we do know that as we get older, um, we turn to more fat, unfortunately, <laughs> right? Like that, that's just part of aging. We but become less water. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. For falls, for, for yeah. bone density, I think there is some benefit to getting older sure. and carrying sure. a little oh, bit yeah. of weight well, Yeah, and even with respect to that, even as we age, though, a lot of people eat less as you age, right? Like your taste buds change, right? Unfortunately, you experience a lot more GERD. But if you have GERD, you're probably going to eat less because you don't want the, the reflux. So people actually tend to lose weight as they age, <laughs> See, you're not that. Well, I mean, like I'm a jet. I'm a, <laughs> I like I tell my students all the time because I do teach geriatrics too, and I'm like, it's been very interesting to see, and I definitely seen this within myself that as I have gotten older, my definition of old changes. Be a push out. Be a So yeah, if you're in your sixties and seventies, that's not that's not really that old. But when you hit like the 80s, 90s, and so, yeah, that's when you start to see 60s and 70s, no, you're going to be just like you are. 40s. It's too late for me to be that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, this lady had a question, and then you'll come to the front. Oh, she, this is where you come to. Oh, yeah, this lady, she has her hand up. Thank you. I was just wondering um, if there's risks taking these medications for non-diabetics of hypoglycemic episodes, and if no? No, that's a great question. No, because they have multiple mechanisms of action, but one of the ways they work in diabetes is in the pancreas, and the pancreas is what releases insulin. But what they do is you have, a, we say, a non-glucose dependent a glucose dependent insulin secretion. So it is not going to tell your pancreas to pump out insulin if your sugar is normal. So therefore that's why we can give it to people who are not diabetic and they don't become hypoglycemic. So yeah, hypoglycemia would not be a worry in my patients. Yes, please. Uh, first a comment, you won't see old people over a certain age like 75, most clinical studies, because there are two aspects of clinical studies. One is the benefit, the other is the risk. People that are older incur risk, and it's not, in clinical studies, it's not side effects, it's adverse event. So if you're 75 and older, and you have a heart attack, it may have nothing to do with the clinical study, but you actually have to be reported as adverse event. So drug companies are doing this for profit. 
generally have an upper age limitation, not because they're trying to hide data, they don't want the liability of the negative effect. And it's legitimate. Yeah. I was involved in that bill for 40 years. The other thing, well, I have a question though. Yes. He should say, because there's nothing in the uh, aggregate instance, people coming off GLP once, uh, weight gain rebound. Uh, do you have any clinical experience that's anecdotal about that? So, so yeah, yeah, so what the studies are showing, when you remove the drug, you people are putting back on weight. The studies that have come out with semaglutide or zepatide, they have not put back on weight to the to where they were before, right? So let's say you had a patient who started off at two hundred pounds and they dropped to one hundred and seventy pounds. Maybe they went back up to one eighty one eighty five. A lot. Yeah. Yes. So we don't know. We These drugs are still new. Even like terzepatide only came to market. Yeah, we would expect if I take the drug away, right? Because if I'm giving you something that is making you feel full and then I remove that, you are going to eat more. It's the same thing with bariatric surgery. Sure. Because bariatric surgery, the reason why even like insurance companies are paying for it like when I was a student, like it was over 20 years ago now, remember, like they didn't pay for bariatric surgery like they pay for it now, but they saw the benefits. Like you saw less cholesterol issues, less hypertension, less diabetes. But people started to put back on weight, you know, the further outside. So yeah, these drugs, you are going to be able to lose weight now. But if I am getting you to 20% of your weight loss, if I get to you, even if you put back on weight, and you still have 10% like weight loss overall, oh, that's fantastic. That ability to reduce your risk of a cardiovascular disease, let your blood pressure is going to be lower, your LDL is going to be lower, your, your glucose level is going to be better controlled. Like that, there's a benefit to that. But yeah, no, you're going to gain weight when I, take, when I remove that drug. I think it's important to try to remove the stigma that you're cheating with an mm -hmm. anti-obesity drug, right? Again, the clinical guidelines support it if you're falling in the right areas, to your point, with diet, exercise, and behavior modification. And then when you're looking at those studies, you have to remember, too, the test group got diet, exercise, and behavior modification, so they might even have habits that help them when they come back off the drug that keep them in a lower, like not gaining back that weight as fast. But I think that I see it all the time that people have this stigma, if I'm using an anti-obesity drug, I'm cheating. You notice that we're calling them anti-obesity drugs and not weight loss drugs. That's a change in the literature as well. Weight loss might be cheaper. Okay. Maybe you don't really need it. If you're in this group, and you're using an anti-obesity drug, that's not right. Mm. Uh, but if you fall into these groups, it could be really beneficial to use the appropriate dose appropriately and watching for some of those side effects. There's a question that way. Okay. Yes. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Uh, I don't I don't need to Mine's speak. just quick. Uh, what's the length of time that's you're it. seeing most people on these anti-obesity drugs? I'm just gonna repeat the question for the recording. How long is the duration of treatment for these drugs? So, what when these drugs originally came to market? Thank you. When these drugs originally came to market, most of them are studied for about a year. Then they've done extension studies, so they're continuing to follow people who've been on it. There are people who go on them for short term. Like if I'm somebody who went on it and I've achieved my weight loss goal, there are some people who come off. There are some people who were on it three, four years now, right? Um, but we have diabetics that are on them still. Right. So we have some of the tri the data from diabetics being on them that- They're great. They're that, fine. You can be on them for longer. We also see some people don't want to get off, off of them. them. There's that fear factor and they might not need them anymore. And depending on which clinic you go to, some people, what they're doing is not necessarily keeping you on those higher doses for prolonged periods of time. If you've reached your goal, but let's say you want to, you want to stay on it, they're coming down on the dose too. 
Yeah, but I'm I'm never going to say there's a one size fit all approach, right? Because there's some people who you're a little bit above above, maybe your BMI is 26, 27. That extra weight is not it's it, there's a difference. But if your BMI is like 35, you me getting you down significantly with your weight and keeping you down, just like me thinking about that, the cardiovascular ramifications of that is huge. But I'm not saying I'm not saying everybody needs them, right? I think that what we don't do is as we don't spend as much time with patients talking about diet and exercise, like I probably right now as a BMI fit in, I went over to the overweight category and nobody ever talked to me about like, did everybody have asked me, what do I eat? How many times a day exercise? They always ask you about how much alcohol you drink, right? Or how much you smoke. What should we keep doing? Yeah, but we we don't. We don't as a society necessarily um, talk about the therapeutic lifestyle modifications. I live in Henderson. It's great. I like to walk. The rest will laugh at me. I walk around that school all the time. Yeah, like I love to walk. But I also do get that. Imagine if you were in a place like Michigan or Minnesota now where it is below freezing outside. <laughs> you don't want to leave home that much at this point in time. So there are different things. There's not a one size fit all. Yes, somebody else out there. I just wanted to comment on what you're talking about, people needing less food as they get older. A lot of that is because of the sarcopenia, because they are not building muscle, so, they're losing yeah. muscle. And the muscle is the furnace that burns mm -hmm. the calories. Yes. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Chakraborty. For people that are trying to increase their antioxidants, it's me, I have a question. Antioxidants increase their fiber. How would you advise them in terms of eating things like pineapples, mangoes, oranges that have a lot of glucose. Are you saying just stick with the lower glycemic um, things like blueberries, blackberries? Can they have those things in moderation? I mean, there is no way if you give up like a, all the enriched food, if you try to gain weight just eating like a fruit, you cannot do it. There is a study clearly shows like uh, some people they're like a, on like a just fruit diet. All day like they're going to eat fruit. They didn't gain weight. But their glucose went through the roof probably. It's not through the roof because like, a, I mean, you are going to get it because it has a lot of like a cellulose in it, like a lot of fiber, a lot of things. You are going to get full. I mean, how much like a, I mean, fruit can you eat really? <laughs> so, no, I mean, there is like, a, I mean, I mean, there, there is like a, there are like a, in some sects actually, I'm telling you, they're supposed to eat only fruits like a whole day. They don't gain weight. But the moment like you're adding like a, some rice into it, like a, some uh, a flour into it, that's it. That changes the whole thing. So fruits, like if you look at like, a, it comes with like a yes, it comes with like a glucose, it comes with like a, some other sugar, it comes with also antioxidant, fiber, and also like a, even like a, you have to like a, eat like a chewing like a, that, uh, I mean, burning some energy. So I don't think like unless like somebody is like a really crazy, like eating like a five pineapple a day. <laughs> uh, it's fruit is good. I mean, we, we should not say anything against fruit. <laughs> well, then let me get, pass this back to you so we can get your question. Yes. Yes. You, if you add like a, if you are like a thinking about like a making like a 10 pineapples, I mean, I mean, you mix with like a cucumber, like a, I mean, yeah. some other berries into some nuts and all these things, you're fine. Oh, you have that. You need some other things just besides fruit. Okay, uh, okay, yes. just, okay, that's like what the I thought. Beans, vegetarian diet, yeah. yes, good. Uh, but fruits only. Just fruit. Because there's a youngster in our family, he's, I think, 19, 
He's only eating fruit, um, but ma mo uh, mostly mangoes. And all of us, the adults, we said something's wrong with that. But I don't, I just, in my mind, that's just not right. He's very, very skinny now. Yeah. <laughs> oh. He'll have some potential nutrients. Right. So. Uh, that he's going to be missing out on if you, especially if it's only mangoes. Yeah, if he's only mango and he's he got very very skinny. I think he's too skinny. That's the thing. I have a friend in Poland. She's she's tried almost every diet imaginable out there like since we were teenagers. She has successfully lost weight on every diet. She was the first one at first, and, um, but when I was a teenager, that was Atkins, because she came to my house, she opened my fridge, and she was like, trying all this bacon. I was like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm on this new diet. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I can eat any amount of meat I want, right? And that's what she did. She ate, like, she ate no carbs. She lost a lot of weight. She did HCG. She's done every diet out there, and she's she puts it back on. Oh. Right? <laughs> Avocados. Okay. I'm gonna tell him, but he's not listening to anybody. He's not listening, but I'll tell him. Oh, Yeah. Oh, I thought you were gonna say it was uh Joni's boy. Oh uh I'm oh. No, it's his nephew. He's 